I heard you're the best. Cool. I heard you're the best. Uh, I don't know about that. Hi, this is Daryl Peterson with Micromeasurements, and this afternoon I've got my friend uh, Rick Rummel, who is from our uh, division, the BLH division that manufactures uh, load cells. And I thought uh, Rick has a few minutes. We'd uh, take a couple minutes here and uh, show a typical strain gauge installation. Uh, this one happens to be on a, a piece of stainless steel, which is a uh, uh, something for holding your water, right, to keep you hydrated. Or coffee. Or coffee, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do, we're going to put a strain gauge on the outside and just kind of demonstrate a basic uh, strain gauge installation technique uh, for Rick. The, the BLH product line is a, a bunch of uh, commercially available finished load cells and transducers. So I don't know how often you get to see kind of the behind the scenes work of putting the gauge on, but at least in this example, it's pretty simple, straightforward lay a gauge on the outside of a round surface. I usually don't see this um, part of the business, so looking forward to it. Okay, there. cool. Uh, but we're gonna use the micro measurements uh, strain gauges. I'm gonna open this box if I can get it open and take out one of them just to kind of show it to you. It's a uh, one of our newest products. Um, which is a relatively little tiny strain gauge and then all of this wire. Uh, what we're finding uh, today more and more is that customers want to speed up the installation process, make it faster and easier. And one of the ways that we can help customers do that is by uh, supplying the gauge with the cables already pre-attached. Uh, difficult to see this in the camera. Rick can see it, but this is actually a three element rosette. So it's got three sensitive grids. And then this uh, uh, new design, which is a flex circuit that ties to the three grids and ties it back to this transition point where we've got the three conductor lead wire. So why would you want three elements? That's a great question. Um, typically the reason why you, you pick a gauge that kind of looks like this is that you're not sure of the the maximum and minimum principal strains and direction that's on that surface. Maybe something a little more complex than this water bottle, but um, in general, when you're looking at an installation and you're not quite sure about the orientation of the strain gauge, that's the time to start looking at a three element rosette because it allows you to solve for your maximum, minimum principal strains and direction. Now, the way it does that is it has those three separate measurements at fixed angles so from those three separate measurements, we can calculate our three unknowns, which are maximum principal strain, minimum principal strain, and what angle they are oriented on that surface. I'm gonna assume those come in different sizes also? They do, a wide variety of uh, different sizes. This one happens to be a pretty small one. Uh, this one was kind of, uh, when it was originally developed, uh, it was sort of targeted for uh, customers uh, putting strain gauges on printed circuit board assemblies. Uh, where they're testing the strain on the components as it goes through maybe different manufacturing processes. Uh, but today you can use these on printed circuit boards. You could use them on a piece of construction equipment. It's really, you would select a gauge like this when you, when you look at the space that you've got available in the area and you need a three element rosette and a small package, this would be one uh, to take a look at. And the newest thing with this one is this flex circuit. That's kind of a new design for us. Uh, trying to make that transition from going from this ribbon cable over to that rosette, and we like it. It's uh, pretty simple and easy to use and pretty rugged too, since it's a, it's a flex circuit. But I'll take that and kind of push that over to the side. And for us to get started, we need to pick a spot on this drink bottle. It really doesn't much matter. Maybe we leave the logo intact and we just kind of roll it around and put a strain gauge on the back side and really, at this point, we just need to get started with cleaning it. And in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is take one of these gauze pads and I'll kind of fold it. And this is some smelly stuff, so look the other way. I'm gonna take the CSM3, spray it into a gauze pad, and then just wipe off the surface of this thing. That's where we've been handling it and holding it and drinking water out of it and all that. 
I don't think the intent was to put a gauge on it till now. So again, you're just trying to get off any oils that might be on it, that sort of thing. Now, and this is really true for any strain gauge installation project. Usually the first thing you wanna do is degrease it. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna add some surface texture. And stainless steel can be really tough because it's so hard. So what I like to do is drop back to a 220 grit uh, silicon carbide paper. I'm gonna tear about a, yeah, probably a two inch piece of it, fold it back over on itself like that. And I'm gonna pick a spot right here at about in the center and what I like to do in particular on stainless is uh, cross hatch it. So I'll sand it this way and then I'll turn and go 90 degrees to that. And the idea of what we're trying to do is introduce a uniform texture. We're trying to, to sort of reduce the shine. You know, the shiny means the light's reflecting off of it really well. And we actually don't want that. What we want is a nice dull surface. So I'll sand it that direction, and I'll take it and turn it. And I, am I correct in thinking, Daryl, that you don't want a real smooth surface either? Correct. You want some texture. You want it to have a little bit of texture to it, because what that means is that you've got more surface roughness. For, for it to adhere to. For it to adhere. That's exactly right. And in this case, it almost looks like we've gone through some type of initial coating that's on it. And now we're down to the, the, the base material and you can kind of see where I've been cross hatching. So sure. once I've done that, I'm just gonna take another gauze pad and just kind of wipe it. Just wipe off some of that excess dust. And off of it. I'm guessing that's some type of clear coating they put on it. <clears throat> All right, and the next step is gonna to be to uh, scrub it. And what we're gonna use is conditioner, it's a red tip bottle. And I'm gonna use a step here where I take another piece of the 220 grit paper. I'm gonna braid with the conditioner and that's called a wet abrade. Not quite as aggressive this time, just kind of a few strokes back and forth. Again, trying to create that texture. And this conditioner is a mild phosphoric acid, so it helps to chemically etch the surface and kind of get it ready for bonding. You've done this before, haven't you, Derek? Yeah, maybe once or twice. All right, so once, you, once you've wet abraded it, we're gonna take a little bit more of the uh, conditioner, the red tip bottle. And then I'm gonna take one of these cotton tip applicators. They look just like the Q-tips you'd use at home. You kind of scrub that area. And see as it comes up a little bit gray, sometimes these will absorb a little bit of material, so you put a little bit more on it. And if you keep scrubbing and it keeps coming up gray, get another one. It is an etchant, so sometimes you'll find it'll have a little slight grayish tint to it. But I think that looks good. One more gauze pad to wipe it. And I try to start inside the cleaned area with a seam, with a uh, clean side of the gauze. And I'll take it and kind of fold it and go in the other direction. Now this last step is one of the most important if you're gonna use the adhesive that we're gonna use, which is the Embon 200. And what we find is Embon 200 is very sensitive to the surface pH. And we just introduced the conditioner, which is a mild phosphoric acid. So the pH went down and now what we've got to do is bring it back up. And what we're gonna bring it back up with is a neutralizer. So I'll just take a few drops, put that on it. Another cotton tip applicator and scrub it. And you can see that really it's coming up clean at this point. Now I can't say this is the exact process that they use at BLH for putting on strain gauges, but in general, it's gonna be something like that. They're gonna degrease it, uh, they're gonna abrade it, and then they're gonna chemically clean it, make sure it has the right pH, and then they'll move to uh, gluing the strain gauge on. So at this point, basically this thing is ready for a strain gauge. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it and just 
Make sure we're working on a nice clean dry sheet of paper. I'll take these top couple of sheets off. Put you those to, to the side. This down, don't you? Yeah, let's wipe off the underside of that. That's a good idea too. All right, and <clears throat> the next step is to get the strain gauge ready. And before we do that, we're gonna take the gauge and we're gonna lay it out on a clean glass plate. Clean being the, the word here because we need to make sure we wipe it off because sometimes it can pick up a little bit of dust. So we'll take a couple of drops of the neutralizer and the gauze pad and just kind of wipe it off. Hey, this is old hat for you, Daryl, but this is very educational and informative to me. Oh, cool. What you would find in a volume production, the processes can be very similar in that they're going to be doing a lot of the same types of things. They just figure out ways to do it in much higher volumes uh, because they need to move a lot faster than Daryl can. So, all right, we're going to find the strain gauge. Always very important for you to find the strain gauge and see which side is the top side and which side is the bottom side. And like in this case, if you take it and you kind of flip it over, one of the things I'm looking for is that dull area on the back side of the gauge. That's the bottom side. It's been treated for bonding to promote adhesion. And this is the top side. And you can tell that. It's hard to see in the camera, but you can tell that from the solder connections. And what I'm thinking that we'll do is maybe lay the gauge going in this direction. Or we could lay it in that direction or that direction, but really with a three element rosette, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Uh, but what I'm thinking we're gonna do is we're just gonna lay it and we'll just wrap the wires around the, uh, the can. We could go that way. Or we could, quite frankly, we could go at an angle if we want to. What do you think? With a three element rosette, it really doesn't matter. Our reference axis, by the way. I like that direction. You like that one? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's do Plain that. Plain and simple. Let's do that. All right. So what I'm going to do is just lay it onto the piece of glass. And I'm going to use the uh, gauge installation tape. I'll tear off a few inches of it where it's maybe picked up some dust. And this gauge with the flex circuit is pretty long. So I'm going to take a piece of tape. It's maybe about five inches long. I always like to put a little handle at the end of it like that. It kind of helps me. And then what we're going to do is take this and kind of slowly wipe it down into place. So now what I've got is the strain gauge, piece of tape covering over it, and all I'm going to do is lift the tape back up, and now I can take it and position it over top of the, I keep calling it a can, but it's really more like a water bottle. Is it a bottle? It's not really a bottle, is it? Container. Container, water container. Container. <laughs> Let's call it a container. All right, so <clears throat> tape's in place over top of the gauge. That's been chemically cleaned. Now we're ready to marry the two up. And this is the, this is the trickiest part of handling strain gauges is you don't want to bend them too much because if you bend them too much, you can cause a resistance to shift and we don't want that. So what we're going to do is lift the tape at kind of a shallow angle. And once I get the gauge picked up, I'll go ahead and lift the whole thing up. It's really that simple and that easy. I'll move the glass out of the way. Let me turn this at an angle so it's a little bit easier. If you can hold that, that would be awesome. I'm going to put it right in the middle of that and just tape it down into place like that. Should we show this to our audience? Yeah, I think so. So now we're going to bond mm -hmm. uh, the strain gauge down into place. Now the most critical aspect of this to get bonded is the gauge itself. You know, that's the part that's going to be transferring the strain. The flex circuit, in some cases, you may want to leave it unbonded. It, it might make sense if you're trying to, to move it to a different area. You know, maybe I need to bend this over and bend it up. Uh, you can do that with this flex circuit. It has some flexibility, so you can kind of move it around. 
Here it's not so critical, so it doesn't really matter much. Uh, but what we're going to focus on is getting that strain gauge installed uh, right at that location, and then we can make sure these these wires are bonded well, and we put st strain relief on the wires so that they don't tug on the strain gauge. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift the tape, again at a shallow angle, peel it back. Sometimes it's helpful if you sort of tack the tape backwards. It'll kind of stay in place a little bit better. We'll see if I can tack that down. And there you can see the bonding side of the strain gauge. You can see the flex. Uh, we're gonna use the Inbond 200. So I'm gonna take the catalyst. This is, the, this is probably where most folks using this adhesive run into trouble. They think more of this catalyst is better and actually it's just the opposite. 98% of this is isopropyl alcohol and you want to leave it in the bottle. So I'm going to try to touch it on the inside part of the bottle, yeah, maybe about 10 times, something like that. And I'll just take it and we'll, we'll glue down part of that flex as well. And just apply it on the back side of the strain gauge. And then now you give it a minute. <clears throat> so the reason that you give it a minute is you're waiting on the solvent to air dry. And where customers run into problems sometimes is that they are trying to speed things up and they use this catalyst and they put it on and they don't wait long enough. And what happens is the isopropyl alcohol keeps the cyanoacrylate from bonding. So you brush it on there, the isopropyl alcohol is just a carrier for the catalyst and you got to give it time to air dry to leave that catalyst behind. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever bonding strain gauges with Inbond 200 and you use Catalyst, be patient. That's what I'm trying to tell you, Rick. Be patient. Understood. So we got a few more seconds. So as we're waiting, the next thing I'm going to do is take a gauze pad and just fold it up like this, and I'm going to use it as a squeegee. So once we get to our one minute, and we're very close to that, I'll take a drop of the adhesive. I can go ahead and do this. And I'm going to squeeze a drop of it out. I'll just clean off the tip. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel this tape back. I'm going to put a good bit of adhesive right here at the junction of that tape and that bottle. And then I'm going to wipe it over top of the strain gauge just like that. And then I'm going to put my thumb on it and I'm gonna keep it on there for a full 60 seconds. So, set my timer, so let me hold it. So you can pick it up and you can move it around. Um, at this point, we've got kind of the front side of this flex circuit and the strain gauge bonded. Uh, we can go back and bond uh, this other side as well, just to help keep the flex circuit down on the surface and keep the wires, you know, make sure they've got a good base so they don't, uh, they don't come off. So the um, wire, cable run, whatever you call this, mm -hmm. how far can you go? That's a great question. There's really not a, there's not a well-defined limit. Uh, what we look for is keeping the resistance of the wire at an absolute max, less than 10% of the resistance of the strain gauge. So for example, 350 ohm strain gauges, Try to keep the wire resistance less than about 35 ohms uh, because that means that you're going to be desensitizing the strain gauge um, <clears throat> by about 10% at that level. And even though you can mathematically correct for it, and it's easy to do. In general, we get a little nervous when you start desensitizing the strain gauge by more than 10%. Okay. So it's not uncommon at all for strain gauges to have lead wire lengths of 100 feet, 200 feet, and when you actually go through the math behind it, it's really not that significant from a resistance standpoint. Uh, in particular, if you're using 350 ohm strain gauges or higher. And we've got a new line of strain gauges now that are 5,000 ohms in resistance. So man, when you really look at the math behind the lead wire resistance, it's almost negligible compared to a 5,000 ohm strain gauge. Great. Well past a minute, Daryl. Well past a minute. Have I been talking that long? <laughs> I've been counting. <laughs> All right, so at this point, we've got the gauge installed. 
the only other thing I'm gonna do is uh, put a little bit of adhesive on the flex and I'm gonna glue that down on the other side. So I'll kind of lift this up just a little bit. If you can hold that right there, I'll put sure. a drop of adhesive on it. Again, this is just the flex circuit part of it. So I'll put a drop of adhesive right there. And then I'm gonna take the gauze pad, you hold that, and I'll just wipe it over into place. We'll go ahead and wipe it on out. Wipe the tape back down. And just kind of run my finger over it and put my finger over top of that. So now we got another minute. So as we wait, um, you know, again, you want to set a timer. You want to give it a full 60 seconds. And in general, with this adhesive, we put one minute of thumb pressure on it, and then we let it sit for two minutes, and then we can peel the tape off and start testing. Um, in this case, I think we'll just, uh, we're about to wrap it up. We could let it sit overnight if we wanted to in like a controlled setting like this area. Uh, you could leave the tape in place, come back tomorrow, peel it off, and apply a protective coating. Uh, if you're outdoors, you really don't want to do that because the moisture, the humidity in the air will attack uh, cyanoacrylate. So you want to make sure that you plan it so that you have your environmental coating in place before you leave uh, at night because you don't want to leave strain gauges unprotected outside. But in a laboratory setting, it's uh, not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I've waited my one minute for that. You'll notice I turn my thumb a little bit. Sometimes the outer edge of your thumb will get stuck down by the adhesive. And if you find that to be the case, instead of lifting up, just take it and turn it and it should release. And at this point, normally what we would do is let it sit for two more minutes. And then we're basically ready to take the tape off and apply the protective coating. Um, since the gauge has already been sitting there, I'm gonna go start this tape at the gauge side. I don't know how well you can see that in the camera, but I'll start it. <clears throat> Notice how I'll peel it directly back on itself. All the way down uh, to the flex and then off the wires. And so we've got the gauge installed. <clears throat> we've got the flex circuit bonded. And really the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply a protective coating. Now, in order to make it look nice, I'm gonna mask it off. So I'll just put a couple of pieces of uh, paper drafting tape around it. I'll put that around the gauge. Put that around the lead wires. And we'll come back and we'll add some additional strain relief to these wires later on. But I want to go ahead and get this protective coating on it. Uh, this protective coating that we're going to use is the MCOAT C, which is a, this is actually a Dow Corning product. It's 3140 that we add some solvent to it. Uh, fantastic environmental coating for laboratory settings. Uh, something where you're trying to get a little bit of protection over top of it, something that won't locally reinforce it. Like if you got a very thin part like this is, that, that can help to um, minimize how much the environmental coating would add stiffness. Uh, it also has a very wide temperature range up to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, the great thing about it is it's very easy to brush on. So what I'm going to do is just kind of brush it around, brush it over top of the little flex circuit on the top of the wires. It's uh, self-leveling, so if you give it a minute, it'll kind of level itself out. And that's really it. Now, in general, when you're installing gauges, it's a good idea to check them electrically before you put on an environmental coating. Um, in this case, we just sort of cut that step out, went straight to putting on the environmental coating. We're gonna let that dry and we'll come back tomorrow and uh, we'll be able to test this. Fantastic, very so, good job, Daryl. So that's a strain gauge installation, maybe not quite the same as what you'd put inside of a load cell, but uh, a lot of the process is very similar. Sure, okay. Well, thanks for the demonstration. All right, you're welcome. 
So if you'd like to find out more about strain gauge installation or uh, any of these products that we've used during the installation, uh, please feel free to visit the website at www.micro-measurements.com or if you're looking for load sales, go w visit BLH. www.blhnobel.com. Cool. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you.